Hey, and I hope you had a great weekend. So I want to do things a little differently this morning. Um, see, there's no background. I'm just going to talk about insulin resistance. What I would like to do is explain it, explain some of the things that are leading into it or that are caused by it. So you can have a better understanding of what it is and how um, you can go about taking care of this one thing that's impacting 93% of us and our health. So again, that's insulin resistance. But when we think about insulin resistance, most people think about like diabetes and being overweight, but there's so much more to it than that. It affects your liver. It affects your kidneys. It affects your heart. It can cause high blood pressure, which I'll be doing in-depth videos all week this week on how insulin resistance is causing your high blood pressure and the fact that 95% of high blood pressure comes from insulin resistance. And so it's affecting all that. It's affecting your brain because your brain becomes insulin resistant at the same rate that your body does. We don't think about anxiety, depression, good morning, Melba, um, all of those things being related to insulin resistance or arthritis being related to insulin resistance or gout or PCOS or erectile dysfunction or sleep apnea or any of those things. So if you guys are having troubles <clears throat> with your health, that is not something that's genetic or viral, drop it in the chat and let's discuss if it is linked to insulin resistance or not and see if we can find a better way around everything for you guys. So if you're anything like me, you've been suffering two and a half years ago. I couldn't go up and down stairs. I had a walker. I had a cane. I was in pain. My life was unrecognizable to me. My blood pressure would run to 180 over 150 at some point during every single day. Um, and we're going to talk about that because this is blood pressure week for me. Hold on a second. Oh, it's gone. The blanket I usually use to keep my legs warm is gone. Now what? Now what? Okay, so yes, your blood pressure can be that high, you guys. And, and you can still be upright like I was. How? I'm not quite sure. What I do know is that that kind of blood pressure, 130 over 80 or higher, starts to cause damage in your heart. So if you're starting to have high blood pressure, understand you need to take care of it right away. You're not going to probably be as lucky as I was. Um, don't know. God must have a plan for me and why I'm still here. So let's work that plan out because I want to help you guys change your life and save your life. So Melba, Melba, it's so good to see you. Um, all right, so where are you guys all hopping in from? I'm up in Maryland in the U.S. It's a beautiful morning. Fooled us over here. It looked like it was going to get cold, and then we had a beautiful, beautiful warm weekend. Um, so I love hearing from everybody. I'm working with some people in Australia right now. Um, so let's dive in. Yeah, we are, we're worldwide. Okay, so we're going to go over what insulin resistance is or... And then we're going to go over the things that it's linked to. And then I'm going to tell you at the very end how I got rid of it and how you can too. And we're going to go over all that. But hey, from no Northwest PA, nice. <laughs> Scotland, yes, Senga. Um, so you guys, um, it's really important to go that I go through it in these steps. And sometimes I like doubt myself, but I really do think it's important to go through these steps so you understand when I get to the end and explain to you how you're going to overcome it, that you can really realize that this is real and that this is, we're not talking about Ozempic, Manjaro, and insulin shots, all of that. So hang out because I'm going to explain how to overcome it. From South Africa, hey Fifi, we are finally open in South Africa as well. So all right, guys, <clears throat> this thing called insulin resistance. Um, and Sometimes I forget. I worked in medical for years, so uh, I, I try to break it down so it's as easily understandable as possible. And I'm not going to go into depth in anything in this live, except for that I'm going to kind of link the dots for you guys. So insulin resistance really is just this uh, having too much insulin in our body that our body becomes resistant to it. And why is that important? Because our cells need energy. We're living, breathing organisms, every single, what is it? I heard a neuroscientist say that there's like 32 billion trillion chemical reactions going on in our body every second that we are alive. 32 billion trillion reactions going on in our body. <clears throat> that means, sorry. 
<clears throat> that means the cells need energy to continue creating those reactions. When that breaks down, when we're not having the energy for our body to do what it's meant to, we start to feel sick. We start to have brain fog. We start to feel fatigued. We maybe get headaches. Our eyesight starts going. We're having bleeding teeth and gums. We're having skin discoloration. We're having aching joints. We're having a gut that hurts. We're having a body that won't process foods. And so you have IBS or Crohn's. We're having liver problems and on and on and on. So insulin resistance is really a disorder where the body can't utilize the energy that we need. You see, insulin is an energy transporter. Um, I've recently been talking about it like a key as well. So all of our cells have, <laughs> and that's pretty common of everybody. So hang out, Kitty, because we're going to go over how, why this is happening. And then I will show you guys what I did and, and I'll give you a couple of solutions as to how you can fix it. All right. So when we eat food, remember food is just energy in our body. So we eat food, our body converts it to the substance called glucose or sugar in our bloodstream. And that's our energy. Hello, Dan. Good morning. You guys, I love you over here. I've got Facebook and YouTube up this morning too. Hi from Texas. <laughs> I, I need to get back to Texas and visit sometime soon, like hopefully this next year. All right. So I'm going to stay on track real quick here. So food just converts to energy in our system. We need to understand that. That energy, we're going to call it glucose, okay? So when we have more than one teaspoon of that in our bloodstream, our body says, hey, hey, Kath, we've got to get this out to the cells because our cells are needing it. It can't just hang out in the bloodstream. And, and by the way, when all that sugar does hang out in the bloodstream, it starts to clog it up. It starts to cause dysfunction in the bloodstream as well. All right. So the blood cells are fighting with the sugar cells and it's not a good thing. So we got to get the sugar out of the blood and into the cells of the body. That's what insulin does. Sounds like a pretty good thing, right? So why is everybody up in arms about insulin? Because we're eating too often and we're eating food that's converting into sugar too quickly so that means now more than ever, we are having this problem with insulin resistance. And I'm going to go over why PCOS is linked in a little bit. You'll understand this. But I also heard yesterday that from a, a doctor that uh, they're about, okay, so in my age, when I was growing up, which explains why I was never diagnosed with PCOS, there were about 100 women worldwide diagnosed with PCOS around the time I was born, Okay. Today, there's over 12, I, I don't know, it's a huge number, 1,200,000 something worldwide. It's in change in our lifetime. I'm going to get those numbers today and I will put them out in the video because I don't remember them as well as I thought I would. But anyway, it's more than 100 times the incidence of PCOS in one generation, one lifespan, and that's insane. Nothing in ge genetics changes that quickly. So if it's not our genetics, what did change? And I'm hearing more and more doctors talk about this. If we didn't have all of these issues 80, 100 years ago, and all of a sudden it's so prevalent today, why is that? Well, it comes down to that food that we're eating. So you guys, I will answer questions in a little bit, but um, all right. So too much food turning into glucose too quickly. Well, how does that happen? It's because our food has been modified. It's been manufactured. Hey, Karen. And it, we're no longer al allowing the food to take its time to transfer through our body and into the energy and, and like time release like it's supposed to. What does that for us? Fiber does that for us. So in the absence of fibers and phytonutrients and enzymes and proteins that are supposed to be in our foods, our foods are passing through us too quickly. If you wonder why so many people are suffering with IBS and gut issues and where, where food literally is passing through you too quickly, because we've stripped our foods of all of these fibers. Now, we know that insulin, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit all over the place because I get so excited. Um, but we know that insulin is supposed to transport the energy, right? So we're eating food too often, too much turns into glucose too quickly. Now what's happening is the cells are being slammed with insulin. It's an energy transport. Thanks, Mitzi. I, 
I just, I have so much rambling in my head and some days, by the way, if you haven't noticed before, I will, you will know, I will tell you now I'm ADD. So I really have to like keep on track. Um, and there's so much information out there. My mind is just like, Ooh, say this, say that. But all right. So the food is turning into energy too quickly. Our cells need it, but let's take a look at this. So if we're eating, when we, when we're not eating our, our sugar levels, our, our insulin levels are, are low. When we eat, our sugar levels start to rise. And if we're eating food that's not wrapped in fibers and these other things that we need, it rises really quickly. Now, remember, the body's going to cue insulin to come out because there's too much energy in the bloodstream. So the, the insulin starts to rise and the insulin kind of has to come up a little bit higher. It grabs all of this energy and it starts to deliver it to the, to the cells. Okay. Now, when we're doing this all the time, instead of it ever being down here, it's always up here. So our, we're eating every two hours. We're eating food. Hey, Kamisha. We're eating food that's turning into sugar too quickly. And now our sugar is high almost constantly. So that means our insulin is trained to come up here and be above the sugar to grab that and deliver it. So we're constantly having this high amount of insulin because we have to have insulin when our sugars are high. Some people will say our blood sugar drops. We'll go over that if you... Um, um, ask in a little bit, I'll tell you why you get this low blood sugar and why it's related to insulin resistance. But understand that our body is very trainable. So if we're eating all the time, our food is converting to glucose all the time, guess what happens to the body? It says, I've got to continually put out insulin so that it's at a high amount because this person over here is going to just dump all of the sugar into my system and we got to get rid of it. So now I'm going to have this army of insulin out here ready to take off this, this sugar and distribute it. But what happens then is the cells of the body are like, that's fine and dandy, but I don't want any more. I've had enough. You're knocking at my door all times, day and night. I'm done. So now that key that insulin has that unlocks the cell to allow the energy in, that key in the presence of too much insulin starts to get a little bit rusty. So the cell starts to get resistant and now the cells are not taking up the energy it needs. Now you're starting to get sick. So, um, Fifi, I'm going to go over all of that in just a little bit. Hang out for a second. We'll go over that. If I don't stay on track, I'm going to get all over the place. So I hope that makes sense. Insulin resistance comes from food that's imperfect. We're eating too often and it's turning into sugar too quickly. So we've got to slow that process down. Part of it is we don't need to snack. We're gonna go over that too. Um, and then, so if we can get the insulin levels to come down, our cells will start to become responsive to insulin again. But in the meantime, the food industry is selling us snacks. They're telling us to eat every few hours. There's chips and there's protein bars. Look at when candy bars started become evil, they said, okay, we're gonna create a protein bar and that's going to have as much sugar as that candy bar, but we're going to say it's high in protein. So they're going to buy it and think it's healthy for them, but they're still going to buy the snack food. That's what they're doing to us. We don't need that much energy. That's why we get heavy. Okay. So, um, and you guys, it does not relate to whether you're overweight or not, by the way. So there are a number of people who are extremely insulin resistant and thin but it still is affecting the rest of the cells in the body. That has to do with how your fat absorbs this, this insulin. So this is the next step. When the rest of the cells in the body are like, I don't want you, I'm not taking it anymore. <clears throat> insulin says, well, I have a job to do. I have to deliver this energy somewhere. So we have this storehouse in our body and that storehouse is called our fat cells. We have two kinds of fat cells. So, it's going to start storing fat. And if you're the kind of person who has a lot of um, subcutaneous fat or that subcutaneous fat can multiply, it's going to start storing it in those fat cells. But what if you're thin everywhere, but your belly's starting to pooch out? So what's happening there is there's a, there's a center in your brain that cues that excess energy to get stored in this place called visceral fat that's underneath the the muscle wall of the belly, but it reaches up into the throat and in the tongue. And we're going to talk about how that relates to sleep apnea in a little bit. Either way, it's converting that into fat and storing it. Now, when your body says, and this is different for every person, when your body says not storing it as fat anymore, 
then that sugar starts to go back into your bloodstream. This is when you start seeing your, your A1C go up, your blood sugars go up, your triglycerides change. You could have been dealing with this for 14, 20 years. For me, it was over 40 years that I was dealing with it and nobody caught it. Nobody diagnosed it. I had all the symptoms. I had all the stuff and nobody was talking about insulin resistance. In fact, one doctor just told me there's nothing I can do for you. We did all the tests and she came back and said, your metabolic type is the worst I've ever seen and I can't do anything for you. You're always going to be heavy. You're always going to be tired. You're always going to be in pain and your life is going to be greatly shortened and there's nothing I can do. So why am I talking about it on here? For those reasons, because I know that if I worked for a doctor, I was very well educated about my health and no one talked to me about it. Um, oh, she said, I, she was, you know, every doctor, had, you, you guys, doctors have so much on their minds. I've worked for some really kind doctors. I've worked for some that are just like so overwhelmed. They're just like disseminate the information and move on. Um, there's, there's all kinds, just as there's all kinds of us, right? I don't, I don't hold it against her. Um, she was doing her job and she actually, if you could see the look on her face as she was delivering that to me, um, it was devastating for her too. So it wasn't like she was just like, oh yeah, whatever. She was devastated by the fact that she couldn't take care of me or that she didn't have the tools to be able to take care of me. So since then, I found the tools to reverse almost all of that. And, uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. All right. Um, so the interesting thing is because we talked about the fact that insulin resistance is foodborne, okay, that it's a factor of, there's actually two ways that insulin, or there's a number of ways. I'm not going to say two. I could count the ways. Let me count the ways. Food is the primary way we become insulin resistant. That's the big key, okay? There are a couple of other things I want to recognize in, as far as becoming insulin resistant. So Maybe you've had the same diet all your life and you've been fine and all of a sudden you start noticing all these symptoms that I talked about and you're like, what just happened to me? Well, trauma can cause you to be more susceptible to insulin resistance. So it's like flipping a switch. So whether it's a physical trauma or emotional trauma, anytime where cortisol is heightened for a long period of time, you're in an abusive relationship. Those things re remarkably can cause you to be more likely to become insulin resistant than someone with the same genetics and the same diet who hasn't been through that trauma, okay? So the other thing is inflammation. Um, I'll, let's just give me one second. I'm going to finish this and then we'll talk about sugar levels, okay? So if you've ever had an infection or you've had surgery, or again, that physical trauma that causes inflammation in the body, there's a chemical reaction that happens and that starts to make you more likely to be insulin resistant. Ladies, do you ever wonder why you gain more weight after being pregnant? Then, you know, like you could eat whatever and do whatever before you were pregnant and all of a sudden after you're pregnant, you, or have had a child, you have noticed that you're having more problems with your weight, all, all of that. The state of pregnancy puts you naturally as, as a form of um, protection for the body, for the baby, puts you naturally in a slight state of insulin resistance. Now that flip has been switched. The switch has been flipped. There we go. <laughs> the switch has been flipped. So now you're more likely to become insulin resistant because your body's already experienced it during pregnancy. And by the way, I talked about this a few weeks ago, just a little side note. When you breastfeed, you have six times more insulin receptors in your breast than anywhere else in your body. This is important if you're concerned about breast cancer, that you understand insulin resistance. But it's also, if you're having children, when we started moving away from breastfeeding, you remember how ladies would have babies and they'd get all big and puffy and then they would have their child and they would breastfeed and they would all of a sudden like deflate like a, a balloon. Well, the act of breastfeeding helps you become more insulin sensitive again. So that's just a little side note. Um, yeah. Okay, Katie. So that's, I will, we'll talk about that next, but well, I'll, I'll just talk about that right now. And then T Psalms, we're going to talk about the morning blood sugar. So, um, all right. 
I, I, how often should we, and I'm going to tell you that too. All right. So let's go over these three questions really quick. What about people who live in places where they eat organic and no sugar snacks? Our food has been modified. So I'm not just talking about manufactured in the box, in the can from the fast food place. When you look at, if you guys look it up, what our foods used to look like, our food used to be about like a peach used to be about the size of this small, a little bit sweet, crunchy, a little bit tart. Peaches are now bigger than the size of my fist, super juicy. They're just not as firm. That's because fiber has been stripped out. So even if you're buying raw organic food, unless you're growing your food from organic heirloom seeds and you're growing your own food, you're just not getting what you were meant to. Um, I saw another creator putting up a post and say the cantaloupe was the size of her fist and now it's like 10 times the size, right? So all of our foods, how did they get so much bigger? They've stripped fiber out because fiber doesn't taste good. Fiber is bitter, it's hard, and we want bigger, but, and it's more dense, and we want bigger, better, juicier, sweeter food. So the food industry says, okay, we're gonna modify our food and we're gonna create something that they're gonna like. Broccoli is a man-made food, okay? Canola oil is man-made. There's a lot that's changed about our food. I went home to Montana, um, was it last year, the year before? And I was surprised because we had a little piece of land that my parents were keeping for us kids. And on that was a raspberry patch that we had when I was a child. The raspberries, the biggest one I found, biggest one was barely the size of the tip of my pinky. You go into the grocery store and buy organic raspberries now, and they're bigger than the size of my thumb. How does that happen? Think about that. So just eating raw organic makes you it, it better for you. Yes, I'm going to agree with that. But does it stop it? No, because our food has been so changed that our body just doesn't recognize it anymore. So the next question was, um, I'm going to answer Fifi first. How often should we eat? What I do, you guys, to help with my insulin resistance is a simple time-based eating plan. Okay, so we want to allow insulin to come down. That means that I don't want to eat every two hours. I only eat every four to six hours. I try not to snack. I'm human though. I do snack once in a while. I'm going to admit it, like I'm not perfect. Is anybody on here perfect? Because I'm not. Um, but my aim is to go 16 hours without eating. Oh my God, that sounds scary, right? But it's not. So 16 hours without eating, I have my... I will have my break fast today. We had dinner at, what time was it? 5.30 last night, and then I didn't eat again. So say six. Um, so at six o'clock this morning, I was already 12 hours into a fasting, okay? So it's 8.30 now. That means I'm 14 and a half hours into a 16-hour fast. In another hour and a half, I've made 16 hours. I'm going to go over why we want to do that fast in just a minute, too. But so that's how that's and it's healthy you guys. it's extremely healthy. It's not negative. You're not burning up fat. You're not burning up muscle cells. You're not burning up all of that. We're going to go over that too. Um, if you guys want me to in a little bit. Um, okay. So we got a couple of questions about blood sugar and I want to come back to that. So stop eating every two hours, every four to six hours. Let your body utilize the energy that it has, that you've given it, and then allow the body to get out of that state of constantly being fed. Then there's a switch that happens when the body says, with insulin present, the body's saying, I need sugar, I need sugar, I need sugar, whether it's from fruits, vegetables, yes, proteins, any of that, especially the starches and the refined sugars, the body's like, I need that. That's what we're running on for energy. But when you train the body to say it's okay not to have that, and you allow the body to get the insulin down through the practice of fasting, which I'll explain in a little bit, you allow this other switch to turn on, which is called glucagon. Glucagon is the opposite of insulin kind of in the metabolic system. So when glucagon comes out because insulin is low now, glucagon starts to cue you to burn fat for fuel. It starts to cue you to get rid of of old cells and regenerate new cells. Um, remember with insulin, it's trying to do all the work by giving you all the energy. Your body needs that. Just like you have times where you're up and you're doing stuff and you're, and you're working and you have times of rest, your met metabolism needs the same thing. 
Okay, so we're going to go into that in a little bit if anybody needs to know more about that. But I really want to answer these questions about sugar because I've had a couple now. So um, your morning blood sugars, what was that question exactly? I can't remember the, the question exactly about oh, what, what should your morning blood sugars be if you have intermittent, uh, if with intermittent fasting. Okay, that also is going to be different for everybody. What I think you'd like to see is a morning blood sugar of around 98 to 100, 105, 110. Why? Okay, because what we're not taking into consideration for most people um, and Dan, this is going to lead into your question. So Dan on Facebook said, I noticed my evening workout lowers his blood sugar and morning workouts don't reduce the blood sugar as much. So let's talk about that because it's kind of all in the same group, right? So there's this thing called the dawn phenomenon, okay? So the times, the times of day that you eat are not critical. And I work with you on what times that you should eat for you. Okay, um, so you don't have to, like, if you're a shift worker and, and these times don't fit, we work with that. So I would not do a 16-hour fast while breastfeeding. All right, so Fifi asked that question, and no, I would not. But let's get back to the sugars. So you have this thing called the dawn phenomenon. Let's think about it. There's this other hormone in the body that's almost as powerful as insulin. When we talk about hormones, insulin's a hormone, Um there's a number of things we're going to talk about that are hormones, but insulin takes precedence over everything else when it's present in your body. Cortisol is the only thing that really can kind of compete with insulin for that presence in the body, and they kind of work back and forth and make each other worse. But cortisol is the one that gives you the fight or flight response, okay? So when insulin is turned on, it's turning on cortisol slightly all the time. Dawn phenomenon. Cortisol when your body is cued. So for shift workers, that's going to be a different time because your body's changing. This is why people who are shifting shifts, it, it, it's hard on your body. But your body says, like for me, I'm training my body to be up at five every morning because I want to go live at eight and I have all these things I want to do, meditation and stuff first. I will wake up between five and 5.30 every single morning, no alarm. Okay. That's cortisol. Your body goes, oh, it's that time of day. She needs to get up. She has things to do. She has a world to conquer. She's got to go do things. So cortisol rises in the body. Your heart rate starts to go up and it starts to pull um, sugar into the system because your body needs energy. Now your blood sugars are a little bit higher because your body's getting ready for the day. If you wait a couple of hours, even without eating, wait a couple of hours after that dawn phenomenon, that wake them up and get them going part, your blood sugars will come back down. If you're testing your blood sugars right away in the morning and they seem a little high to you, it's probably the dawn phenomenon and the body's natural response of get up, get going. Let's get, let's get moving. Okay. Um, so times of day, let's talk about when your, when your food converts to glucose more quickly and when it converts to glucose less quickly, because even on my team, there's a woman who has been giving some information that I have to say, unfortunately, she's wrong. So let's go over it. We have that dawn phenomenon, right? So we're already having sugar in the body. That also means that anything you eat, whether it's protein, fats, or carbohydrates, fats don't convert into to, um, glucose very quickly at all. But those proteins and those carbohydrates in the morning are, are going to convert into glucose much quicker and at a much higher level than any other time of the day. So is that really the time we want to wake up and have oatmeal and cereal and orange juice and all of that stuff that's already almost all glucose? Is that really the time we want it when we know that that's going to convert so much quicker in our body? No, that's when we want to focus on proteins and fats. Even proteins are going to convert into a little bit more glucose in the morning than they would later in the day. Okay around noon that starts to level out. And so that, that glucose response to your food starts to, to slow down a little bit. In the afternoon, it's when it's the lowest. So for me, what I do, when I will break my fast in about an hour and a half to two hours, I will have, um, I think I have chicken in the fridge, which seems like an odd breakfast, but I'll either have eggs and sausage, uh, no nitrate sausage, 
or I will have some of that chicken and maybe like some green beans. Um, cause that's just where I'm at right now. It's like my ADD, I, I hyper focus on foods too, but I will have a good amount of protein. I will add some fats to that. And we're going to explain why that has to happen as well. And that will be my first meal. Now this evening, um, if I want carbohydrates at all, um, I will have those towards the evening when they're converting to glucose less quickly. What is my reactive hypoglycemia? Okay, so let's talk about reactive hypoglycemia. So wait, and then let's talk about that real quick too. 6 p.m. and start eating at 12 p.m. the next day. Becky, that's perfect. Okay, so the first question, after your initial weight loss, are you still going to lose weight on this program? No. In fact, if you don't have weight to lose, weight to lose, you're going to notice that you're not going to lose weight, but you will have, um, what's going to happen is in an insulin resistant state, your body is not putting on muscle. So you're actually depleting muscle and bone mass out of your body when you're insulin resistant and you're building up fat stores. So you can be skinny fat where you have a lot of fat, but you don't have a lot of mass on your body because the lean mass that you need has been depleted because of the insulin resistance and it's going into the fat cells. When you start to become more insulin sensitive, you're able to put on that lean mass. Um, they've shown bone density getting better. Your ligaments gets, get better. Your meniscal tissue gets better. Your synovial fluid is not getting inflamed and being depleted. So there's a lot of stuff that's really healthy for you that puts weight on in a way that you can't see while the fat is coming off. Now, when you normalize, because this is real food and you're eating normally, you're not going to lose more weight than you should, okay? So it's gonna start nourishing your body and just allow your body to function like it's always meant to function. This is not a weight loss program. It's uh, get, get control of the insulin and all of your health issues and the weight comes off as a result. I lost over 50 pounds on it, um, but my weight stabilized. Now I have to deal with hormonal issues and stuff for like, I'm 59. So there's a whole other ball of wax for me. And we can talk about that later if anybody wants to. So um, yeah. All right. That one I answered on reactive hypoglycemia. Okay. So reactive hypoglycemia um, in, in short happens a little something like this. Remember we have food that's converting to sugar and that is, is pumping up our, our sugar, right? And now we've tra we're training our insulin to stay high. Insulin, remember, is a hormone that delivers this sugar. So however you want to think about it, insulin, you can think about it like a tanker truck that's carrying that sugar out to all the cells in the body. But when you are eating all the time and constantly bouncing that sugar up, not intentionally, right? That's nobody's intention but we feel hungry all the time and we, we feel like we need the sugar and stuff for energy all the time because our cells aren't getting the energy they're supposed to when we're insulin resistant. But now not only do we have too much insulin, we're training it to be high all the time. So let's go back a step. When we eat food and we're metabolically flexible and metabolically healthy, insulin is low. We eat food, the sugar comes up, Bing. There's a message that goes to the pancreas to say, oh, we need insulin now. Now insulin starts to rise. It doesn't just go boom. And here's insulin. It kind of comes up slowly. The pancreas has got to produce it. It's got to get to, into the bloodstream. It's got to get through the body. Now insulin is high. Insulin resistance is happening because we're eating every two hours. The food is converting into sugar too quickly. And now we're training insulin to constantly be present in the body and the cells are sick of it. So hypoglycemia, when the insulin is high already, okay, so it's already high, it's not down here, and you're eating again, the sugar, your, your blood sugar is going to spike, insulin's going to go, yippee, I got a job to do, and it's going to take all of that energy, and it's going to start to deliver it. It's going to knock on the doors of the cells, they're going to say no, most of them, and then it's going to go, okay, I'm going to deliver it as fat, but I got to get it out of here because this person keeps eating every two hours, and they keep eating food that's converting into sugar, and you know, I know that I'm saying that the body says we need energy, so they're going to have candy bars, they're going to have chips, they're going to have starches, they're going to have stuff that's really simple and converts to sugar, so I got to get back up here and I got to stay here. Sugar goes up, insulin delivers it, 
your sugar gets out to the fat cells or wherever, but it's out of your bloodstream. So now you have hypoglycemia, reactive hypoglycemia, because the insulin level is too high all the time. Um, okay. I hope that made sense a little bit. It's not ex exactly scientific and I can do a video on it later, but um, with more of the science, but for this, I, I just want to focus on the overall uh, concepts. Okay. So that's what's happening. Amazingly. So let's talk one more thing about um, high from Tunisia. Uh, let's talk about the insulin response and that hypoglycemia. When your blood sugars get down to about 60, you're still safe. If you are not, and this is according to Dr. Bickman, if you are not experiencing things like lightheadedness, headaches, fatigue, feeling shaky, or like you're going to pass out. If your blood sugars are just dropping, well, then let it get to about 60. Stop all this constant eating and don't be doing. Now, after I just explained that to you, and they have these old school educators who say, oh, drink a glass of orange juice. What does orange juice do? It spikes your insulin up and it has no fiber. So it's, it's spiking the blood sugar, it's spiking the insulin, and now you're caught in this negative feedback loop where you're just going to constantly fight that. So why not? Um, so what I would encourage you to do is find foods that convert into energy more steadily for you. Um, that would be my encouragement. I can't diagnose and I can't tell you. I can tell you what I would do for me. And now that I know, I would never, I don't even have you guys, I don't have fruit juice in my house. Um, my kids don't have fruit juice in their house. They went from having fruit juice for their kids thinking it was healthy to not having any. Um, thanks, Dan. Any, he says he appreciates the way I go about my explanation. Thank you. Um, so they don't have any of that because now we all understand blood sugars a little bit better. So not only has this helped me, it's helping my family. Um, but what I would look for is you're going to get energy. It's not just sugar. Okay. So absolutely be careful if those things are happening and your blood sugar drops too low, but don't be reactive in trying to drive it up again high because you're just training the insulin to be high. This is, this is what I would do. And I would focus on some proteins and um, some longer digesting carbohydrates and wrap them in fiber. So no simple sugars. Um, and then as your blood sugar start to, to kind of close back in and normalize, then you can go um, more into extended fasting and stuff. I would be, I would probably... If you're wearing a Dexcom, that's good because you're going to be very aware, right? But I would maybe start with a 12-hour fast and make sure that you're getting rid of. The other thing would be for you, get rid of, because yours is very exacerbated, <clears throat> get rid of processed sugars and starchy vegetables out of your diet until that starts to normalize. That's, I mean, unfortunately for you, Salexandra, um, South S Alexandra. Okay. So unfortunately that's, what's going to have to happen. So I, I would, if it was me, I would get rid of the, the high sugar foods, the, the simple carbohydrates, anything that's high glycemic, I would get rid of starches and breads and all of that. I would focus on protein and healthy green, crunchy vegetables. Um, yeah. And then as you start to see your blood sugars normalize, then you can extend your fast out a little bit. So let's, can I talk about why we do the 16 hour fast and what happens to your body during that time and why it's so important for us to wait? Um, because I think that make, will make sense to people why we do the intermittent fasting and why it's so important to the way of life that I have now. Um, before I do that, I'm going to disclaimer, I do not do 16, eight fast every day like 93% of my life or more is a 16, eight fast. Um, I'm going to be traveling to see my grandkids. We're going to be having birthday parties and stuff. Um, I will do my fast as I can, but you know, the, the thing is, and, and it's, I, I'm in that trap too. Food is celebration, right? So we're going to celebrate. We're going to have some things. 
I will just take care of it by adding fiber in before I eat when we have those things. But the 16-8 fast. So this is just a hypothetical timeline, you guys. It doesn't mean that this has to be you, that if your life doesn't fit this, it's not going to work for you. No, I work with you and, sh and help you figure out how your fasting hours should work for your lifestyle. Um, all right. So when we eat, our blood sugars are going to rise within about two hours after we eat. It will take about four hours for those blood sugars to start to come back down. Okay. It takes about six hours for them to actually normalize. Now think about it. What we've said about insulin and the response in the body, when our blood sugars are coming down and they're normalizing, now insulin is starting to get the cue that it's not needed anymore because it's saying, oh, this person isn't going to just dump food in their body every two hours or every 15 minutes or every whatever. I can actually take a break because although insulin's a bully because it thinks it's protecting you, it doesn't want to be out there all the time. It wants to take a break and it will. But after six hours when it starts to really like bottom out for your blood sugars and it's like, okay, we're not doing this anymore. It still takes about two hours for insulin to go, oh, 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 okay, 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 I'm nervous. Insulin will finally come down about eight hours after you eat, okay? So after insulin goes down, remember insulin is a primary hormone. It's kind of a bully in your body and it doesn't let other hormones do their job unless it directs them it can. But the component hormone to glucagon or to insulin is glucagon. So let's talk about insulin and glucagon, and then I can go into the rest of this intermittent fasting thing. So insulin is an energy transport hormone, but insulin also blocks fat breakdown, does not allow flat fat burning, encourages fat storage. It's also an energy saver. It's like I worked really hard to store all of this energy in the body. You're not going to take my work away. So it's like, nope, nobody gets to take this energy unless I say so and I say no, okay? So insulin really has to go to sleep and then glucagon can come out and it's, so this is anabolic, saves energy um, and, and disturbs energy. Uh, glucagon is catabolic, it wants to eat things up. It wants to spend energy. It's why it's like, oh yay, there's all this excess energy in this body, I wanna go spend it. I'm having a spending spree. And so glucagon, about two hours after insulin comes down, glucagon can come out. And then glucagon's kind of like, whoa, I, I, I'm not used to this. Is this okay? What are we doing? And about two hours after glucagon comes out, so now we're 10 hours after you last ate, um, then your body starts to produce things like human growth hormone and ketones to start saying, okay, there's no more food coming in. Let's use fat for fuel. Let's use some of these junk cells for fuel. Let's use some of these cells that need to turn over and go away for fuel. And all of that starts to happen around hour 12. So yes, exercise does. So now at about hour 14, your body's really kind of adapted to this fat burning state. It's burning fat for fuel. You're doing a really good job of getting rid of those junk cells. Your gut cells are starting to reset. Your gut's starting to clear out a little bit. So some of that IBS, Crohn's, all of that stuff is starting to, to, you're starting to make a difference on that. And those cells that need to go are starting to go. At hour 16, you have a meal and you feed your body. What I'm going to suggest you do is in the first meal, you have protein and fats and limit your carbs. So we're going to talk about fats and protein and we're going to talk about carbs and fiber in just a little bit, but that's how I would start my first meal. And then about six hours later, I have my next meal, which is again, protein focused and fat focused. And then I have carbs if I'm going to have them at that meal, a higher amount of carbs. And I'll talk about macros in a bit too. So exercise, that question. So that we're going to, I'm going to talk about that Melba too, because you guys, every fiber has a different action in your body and that's important to know. So when vegans and people are saying eat the rainbow, there's some efficacy to that because every fiber has a different action. Some are, some are regulating your sugars. Some are helping with your fats. Some are cleaning your gut out. Some are doing all different kinds of actions in your body 
So just getting in one kind of fiber is not going to help you. If you're just eating spinach all the time, that's not giving you all the, the fibers that you need. And I'm going to tell everybody what I've done because it's more sustainable and easy for me when my brain is already full of other stuff than to figure out what foods I'm going to buy and then with my ADD forget they're there and then have to throw them out in a week. That's my life. All right, so exercise. 25 to 30 percent of your body is in your skeletal muscle, okay? 25 to 30 percent. Your muscle tissue is highly insulin sensitive, meaning as it's working, it's one of the tissues that's going to open up and be like, yeah, insulin, come on in. I just did this work and now I need insulin and because I need energy to repair, rebuild, all of that. All right. So there's a lot of difference out there. Um, and I learned some of this when I was powerlifting. So for those of you who don't know, I was a world champion powerlifter uh, until insulin resistance really started destroying my life and I had to quit. Um, but there was this thing, and I don't know if anybody have heard of it, uh, is called carb backloading. And I want to talk about the importance of eating either before your, your workout or after. And can any of you guys guess which one I'm going to tell you I believe in more? before or after. So if you think it's before, put a one. If you think it's after, put a two. And in the meantime, I'm going to answer, David, can you eat nuts during your fasting? No. Nuts, most nuts are very high in carbohydrates. They're going to spike your insulin back up. Okay. You don't want to spike your insulin. Okay. Yep. You have to eat those, have those nuts after you break your fast, not during your fasting for these purposes. Okay. So I have a one over here. Anybody else guess? One is before, two is after. Which time should you eat when you're working out? Before or after? One or two? Um, good. Okay, so I have a one. I have a two. Let's talk about that. I know a lot of people. <laughs> thank you, Bernadette. Great, Jessica, Don. All right. Don, yeah. Okay, so one, you're eating before. Okay, so you've, you've put energy in your system, and I can see why people would say one, right? Because you're thinking, I'm going to go work out. I need energy for the workout. But if your goal is fat burning, if your goal is getting rid of junk cells, if your goal is to make your muscles as open as they can be to take in energy when you're ready to deliver energy, I wouldn't eat before. I used to work out fasted all the time, um, and guess what? I still won four gold medals at a world level. Training fasted almost every single time. I didn't pump my body full of excess carbohydrates when I competed. At first I did because that's what I was told. And then I noticed it just made me lethargic. It made me not lift better. It, it, it didn't do anything for me. So did I take in nutrients during a, a six hour day of lifting? Yes, I did. But I didn't start my day with high carbohydrates. So what happens is now you're front loading that and your body's actually storing it as fat. And then you're going to the gym and try, hoping to convert it back into muscle. But you're actually, if you've already eaten and that insulin, because you're not, your muscles aren't open and insulin is already taking that and putting it in the fat cells. And we know it's more difficult to get it out of the fat cells than it is to get it in the fat cells. That's what's happening when you eat before you work out. Okay, so I would actually work out a lot during my 16 hour fasting time and had no problems whatsoever. But now what happens is I'm you're not losing muscle, by the way, when you do this. Your body does anybody think their body is that dumb that it's gonna be like, oh, there's all this fat, there's all this energy, there's all this other stuff that I can use up but I'm hungry and I'm working out. So I'm going to go burn off the muscle I'm trying to build before I touch that stuff. No, it's not. It's going to start burning up that fat if you don't eat before you work out. If you do, you're storing fat and your body's like, okay, there's that energy. Now you have to work out harder. And if you just wait till after you're done working out, your muscle cells are open. You've allowed yourself to burn some fat for fuel. You've allowed this this great metabolic state to happen, but now your muscles are open and ready for energy for up to about two hours after you work out. So then is when you want to take food in. And again, I would 
prioritize fat and proteins, but I would, that's the time of day that I would get in more carbohydrates because it's going to help with your muscle function and get stored less as uh, fat, okay? Now, I, another thing when we're talking about muscle and um, insulin resistance, when we think about muscle, we think about the things that are making your arms, your legs move, and all of the things my mouth move, right? There's a muscle there. Um, but most times we don't think about our other organs as being muscle tissue. They're a different type of muscle tissue, but they're muscle. So your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your pancreas, those are all muscle, okay? So you're not going to exercise your liver, right? But understand that they're muscle too. So um, if you're storing fat though with insulin resistance, I don't know why my brain just cued in. But dude, I feel like, wait, sidebar. Has anybody ever watched Fer, uh, Fern Gully? Remember with Tone Lo as the voice of that big old, did anybody ever, did anybody ever watch that cartoon Fern Gully? Robin Williams played this uh, this little car this little jungle bat called Batty, and um, he would often have miswiring because they they used him for uh, testing. Anyway, sometimes my brain feels like Batty. Okay, so I hope that explains it, you guys. And carb backloading when I did it back in the day, um, I was doing keto, and so I had very strict under 30 grams of carbohydrates a day. And if I would do any carbohydrates and I was shocked when it worked, I would wait. Um, there was two times when I would have carbohydrates during the week if I wanted to have them. And it was within two hours after doing an extremely intense uh, squat or deadlift workout. Because now my, my whole body is involved in those movements. My whole body has been stressed and my all of my cells are open to taking in uh, the glucose and using it as energy and helping my body get stronger. Those were the two times that I would have um, carbohydrates when I was training. Other than that, I tried to keep the carbohydrates low the rest of the week and I trained out, fa I trained fasted and yes, it still allowed me to become a world champion in my fifties. So nope, it's not damaging like some people try to tell you. Okay. All right. So Anybody have any other questions about any of that? I want to kind of, so extras. Oh, and I do want to say this. So we talked about when to eat and let's, I want to, too many notifications are coming in. All right. So how many of you guys have heard to put bananas in your pre-workout protein shake for that extra energy, right? Let's talk about bananas, if that's okay with you guys real quick. And then I'm going to talk about some, some of the food choices. And then let's dive into like the solution to some of these things if you guys don't have question, other questions. All right. So if we know that we need fiber, that fiber is what's slowing down our food from converting into these substances called glucose um, too quickly that is causing all of this havoc in our world. Um, we need to understand that our body is built like a machine. When we eat, there's enzymes that get hop, happen when we masticate. When we chew, it creates this signaling in our body to start a whole process of enzymes and whatnot for our body to go from the mouth to the butt to digest all that food. When we pre-digest that food by blending it down, we're breaking down the fibers before we ever get that cue in the mouth to start creating these things. Now it hits the gut. We have IBS, we have blowouts, we have all these things. The sugar gets delivered to the cells and more likely the fat cells quicker than ever because the fibers all been broken down. And bananas, by the way, bananas used to have these seeds in them that looked like little pebbles. They were like little rocks and they had strands of fiber. Does anybody remember what, what bananas used to look like and how those strands of fiber have gotten less and less over the years? And the bananas have gotten bigger and bigger and sweeter and sweeter because fiber has been stripped out. And the fiber and those little rock-like pebble seeds that were in them, actually nature is pretty damn smart. It's like, ooh, there's a lot of sugar in this thing. Let's throw all of these things in here 
to slow people down from ingesting it too quickly. You had to work to get to those, just like a pomegranate. You have to work to get to the few seeds in there. There's a reason for that. We in our wisdom have said, we don't care about all that. We're going to strip it all out and we're going to have the stuff that we love so much and that's all we care about, but now we're sick. Okay. Um, I wouldn't call Donya Don asked, when I'm fasting after my first meal, do I start fasting again until my dinner time? I wouldn't call it fasting, but you, I mean, I suppose you could. I just don't eat for six hours. So when we look back, I, again, I'm 59. When I look back at my childhood, we didn't get snacks. We didn't, we didn't get snacks sent in a book bag for us to have mid morning and mid afternoon. We didn't have snack breaks. We didn't have that. We had breakfast if we were lucky. Then we went to school. We had lunch at a given time. Then we went home and we were like, mom, we're hungry. And she's like, you can't have anything. You're going to ruin your dinner. And we waited until dinner time and we were healthy and we were strong and our brains functioned properly. And we didn't have all kinds of mental distress. When we eat all the time, we're just continually cueing blood sugars and insulin in our system. So yes, the short answer is yes. I don't after when I do eat this morning, after I eat that, number one, I'm going to go out and take a walk because we just talked about exercise. I'm going to help that energy actually get utilized in my system. And then I'm not going to eat again until five or six tonight. Then I will be done after that and I will do the same thing again tomorrow. Okay. Um, does it mean I never snack? My grandson was here. We had, you know, he's seven. We play video games and stuff together. Those are the times for me that I shut down and I end up snacking, but I still get fiber in before. Um, so I'm not, it's not like I, I don't live a real life and I never snack. My goal is to not snack. My every day is I don't snack. Okay. So potassium is great for that too, but um, you know what I used to use? So Jenny, um, I do not sell this product and I am no way in affiliated with them, but I'm going to encourage you electrolytes more than carbohydrates are what you need to prevent those Charlie horses. You're probably very low on electrolytes overall. Um, so I don't, and then the other thing, Jenny, is I don't really stay under a certain amount of carbohydrates anymore. I don't do that. I could put it in a food tracker and track it. And if I was really trying to do something, I would keep it under 50. If I was really trying to lose weight and reverse things, I would keep it under 30. My carbs run probably from 60 to 100 in a day. If I'm having weird things, they may go over 100. But um, most days, it's right around 60 to 100. And look, we want things to be sustainable and we want them to be realistic, right? I don't want you counting carbohydrates all day long. If you need to, for it to make sense in your, so that you understand how your, your eating is causing your problems, that's fine. But, um, that's not the lifestyle I want for anybody. I don't want anybody counting their carbohydrates and saying, Ooh, I have to be so restricted. I want you to understand food and what is giving you health and what's not and live a life that you can go out and have a life with your family and your friends and hopefully impact your kids' lives too. So um, protein shakes to prevent Charlie horses. So LMNT, write it down, LMNT. Um, I found them recently. Uh, I'm doing a 30-day challenge to see how it changes in my body. So maybe I shouldn't open my mouth, but I, I really intuitively feel like it's a good product. So it has a lot, it's, it's, some people would call it ketones, but it's electrolytes. It's a lot of salts. So magnesium, potassium, calcium in a very specific um, amount. So it's not like a thousand milligrams of calcium, a thousand milligrams of um, magnesium and a thousand milligrams of potassium because they all have to be in different amounts for you to feel hydrated and for your muscle cramping to stop. So I would maybe add those electrolytes in or some kind of good electrolytes in I do our bone fortify, which I'll show you later, but it has calcium, magnesium. It just doesn't have the uh, potassium in it um, or sodium. 
in it that uh, this other one does, but I use that every night before bed to help me sleep. Yeah, so not the carbs, but the electrolytes to help you stop cramping. So Jenny, do you like the Bone Fortify? And tell me about that. So the Feel Great product doesn't have a lot of electrolytes in it. It's fiber, it's, it's um, minerals, it's uh, vitamins, it's phytosterols, and it's a number of other nutrients, but I wouldn't say that it's high in those electrolytes. Okay, yeah. Sometimes, um, Jenny, because you, you're using it, I, I only usually use one scoop. I also mix our super greens because I understand that I don't eat enough greens. And the Oasis, <laughs> you're, you're hitting all the things, Jenny, yay. So this one, this tea this morning is actually the, I'm gonna tell you, I don't know if you've done this yet. It's called a Unamacha Bomb. We're gonna go over the product real quick. But Jenny, I mix these two together in the morning, but this is higher in caffeine. So people with, with blood pressure shouldn't do that right away. Um, so I mix these two and my blood pressure is still normalized. Tons of energy, um, chai, ceremonial grade chai oka and the herbal mate mix. Um, amazing. It tastes great together. Later today, when this is gone, I'll mix this with the Oasis and have that that way still tastes great, but I get my Oasis in. If I forget to do that, I'll mix the Oasis with my Bone Fortify before bed. Okay. Guys, let's talk about how we're going to get over some of these things. And then I want to dive back in and answer some more questions about um, what what illness is, is, um, is being caused by all of this. And uh, hopefully give you some answers on that and then watch for my videos all week this week i'm going to be breaking down five different ways that insulin resistance causes your high blood pressure from thickened blood vessels to blood vessels that can't open up to blood vessels that are too stiff to all of this stuff even down to cholesterol so um watch for those videos this week i have tried the salted caramel i i have to try the the fuel because I don't, my taste buds, I particularly don't like the salted caramel. Um, I've tried it in a number of things. Now I will put the salted caramel in uh, a protein shake that, I, that I'm working on for the days where I just don't have time to have a full on meal. And I like it in there, but a lot of people, but I'm unique. I don't like the salted caramel. Most people do. Okay. Um, my daughter loves it. Everybody else likes it. I'm just like that weird person. You're always going to find somebody who doesn't. They also have the unflavored one, which I need to try. The, the, the Unamate Fuel has um, MCT oils in it. You guys, I'll try to do a video on MCT oils too. I have so many videos to do this week. Um, it would be great in a vanilla protein shake. So um, my goal is to have uh, that cookbook or at least the drink part of it ready for you guys for Christmas so that you can know how to mix some things together. All right. So back to the protocol, you guys, if we talked about the food is causing the problem and that we're eating too much, you know already that I'm going to advocate for that intermittent fasting. I use the complete protein from our company. Why? Um, you guys, I'm a very, let's, let's break it down just a little bit. I'm a very loyal person. When I find something that works and when I find somebody I can trust, I'm very loyal to them. What I know with Unicity after working with them, after being to the offices, after talking to the scientists and some of the corporate people and just watching how responsive they are to everything, um, I understand that every single product they do has science behind it. And so if I'm going to choose a protein that's out there, I want one that's um, digestible, that has a good vitamin mineral pro profile, that's low in carbohydrates, um, that the body's actually going to use. And I trust that with our protein. Um, some of the proteins, especially when I was powerlifting and I, I lifted in a very strictly drug tested federation, by the way, no, I never did steroids. Um, there are a number of proteins out there that they'll tell you you're getting all this muscle gain and stuff because they're pumping it full of steroids. 
And some of those proteins have caused my fellow athletes to be banned um, up to two years from our organization because they were found to have uh, that in their system. So I use our protein because I know it's it's uh, metabolically available and I trust the company with it. So that's why. Um, all right. So they still have the chocolate protein for a while now. Um, I'm trying to stock up on that. They will not be doing the chocolate when we run out of it or out of it. Um, the vanilla will always be available. So the the recipes that I'm putting together that do have our protein powder in it, I've just adjusted for that by adding in like some cocoa powder. It's easy, you guys, but it's uh, the, the chocolate protein is great. All right, so food. I'm going to advocate for intermittent fasting, and I'm going to wait on the rest of the questions till I get through this little part, okay? So now if we understand that we need fibers, we want to talk about that, right? We got to get fiber in first. And that's going to help slow down how quickly the foods convert into sugar in our system. And I'm going to go over macros in a second and explain those. So you guys, you can try doing this on your own. And if that's if you do it that way and you get healthy, I'm going to applaud you. But if you feel like you need something sustainable, I'm going to go over the protocol that um, we're using. And uh, that just makes it more easy and sustainable for everyone. So fiber first, because remember, it's going to slow down those sugars from getting absorbed into your system. And then protein. Protein converts into sugar half as quickly as carbohydrates do. And then fats. Protein always has to be paired with fats. I promised I would talk about that. We'll talk about that after this section. Then, then after fiber, protein, fats, then you can have the rest of your carbohydrates, okay? Um, and limit them. So, and that's exactly the order you want to eat them off your plate. Fiber, then you want to focus on your protein and fill up with those proteins first and pair them with fats. And then at the end, you can have your carbohydrates and carbohydrates. So let's look at that for macros. Macros just mean the big pieces in your food. So there's, there's um, carbohydrates, there's proteins, and there's fats. Proteins and fats have to be paired. I'll explain that always. I'll explain that later. But you always have to have fats with your protein. Fats are not making you fat. Okay. So if it's not a protein and it's not a fat, then it is a carbohydrate. And this blows people's minds. So corn, peas, green beans, spinach, apples, oranges, all of those are carbohydrates. If it's not a protein, if it's not a fat, it is a carbohydrate. Fiber is just an undigestible carbohydrate. So you're going to see some things that have um, a higher carbohydrate load, and then you want to figure out the fiber that's in there, and then the, the digestible that's going to turn into sugar is actually the balance between the two, but you don't have to get all that sciencey. Just know that if it's not a protein and it's not a fat, then it is a carbohydrate, okay? So that's the order you want to eat. There's been tons of studies and tons of people talk about it, how that changes it. The glucose goddess talks about how that changes, how your glucose is going to spike in your system. Um, Jesse in Shos in Shosby, is that how you say your name? Um, anyway, so what I do because I live a very busy life. I don't. I live alone. I if I go, I already proved it. I had to take a bunch of food up to my kids because I'm leaving in a couple of days and ADD, all of that. I overbuy. I'm like, ooh, this would be a good vegetable to have. This would be a good vegetable to have. This would be a good vegetable to have. I'm gonna really focus on vegetables, and even though I do, I can't eat it all, and it goes to spoil. So, for me, I supplement with my fiber with this packet um, and it's in the system it's in my profile so this gives me the right fibers to help slow down my sugars because there's three specific fibers that help with blood sugars and no they're not in those canister fibers so I take I drink that seven different soluble and unsoluble fibers in that it creates a thick gel matrix in my gut before I eat so that it slows down the food going through my system. It makes me feel quicker before I eat so that I'm not overeating. And it's just giving me all the protection that I've been talking about that's been stripped out of our food. Now, it's in this little packet. One of the things that I love the most is, again, I'm going to be on airplanes two out of the next seven days. I'm going to be traveling and doing a number of other things. So when I'm on a plane, do I want to worry about taking a canister or little baggies of stuff? And how, how am I going to do it? No. I put these in my purse. 
I'm, I bring a bottle along, I put about this much water in it, that goes in, I shake it up, drink it down, wait 10 minutes, and then I eat. That's easy. That's easy for me. And then whatever food they give me on the airplane or wherever I go or whatever my family's planning, I don't have to worry about it. I got my fiber in. Then whatever they do serve, I'm just going to do the same thing, protein and then fats, and then I'll, I'll fill up with the carbohydrates if there's room for those at the end. So that's what I do when I eat before I eat every time I eat. Hey, James, every single time. So do I have, and you guys, both of these are just food. So if you're, if you're wondering, worrying about medications and stuff, it's not going to interfere with medications. You can have more than two of the packets in the morning. Um, the system comes with a tea in the morning and a pre-meal drink before you eat. And I'm going to explain that here now. Um, but I have how many ever I need in a day. In fact, I never worry about it. I understand that, that as I'm getting in more packets of this, I'm actually building better gut health, which we're going to talk about in a minute too, is actually adding to my health overall. So the protocol I do is like this. I wake up in the morning. You've been seeing me drink this tea. This tea is a specific blend of an Argentinian herba mate tea grown right there. We harvest it with the farmers who grow it. They know when to pick it so we're not getting overripe, underripe um, product. And then we take that, we fire roast it so that you get the components out of it that we need to affect your metabolism and your brain. And uh, then we extract those. We concentrate them. So there's 375 times uh, components in this as in a normal herba mate tea. But the last step we do is we take it and we shoot it through a science or a science based lab that takes out the uh, environmental toxins like pesticides and the PAHs and stuff. So now it's extracted, highly concentrated, extremely pure, just like a power punch. But what does the tea do and why? The tea is affecting your brain. When you're tired and you're hungry, you're tired and you're hungry. Your brain is tired because it has insulin receptors too, and they're not getting the energy they need. So the brain is like, I need energy, and that's cueing hunger for you, okay? This can cue hunger. It's not just your gut that's saying, oh, I'm hungry. Your brain says, I need carbohydrates. I need fuel. I'm hungry. What the T does is it gets components through that blood-brain barrier that are allowing energy to actually get to the brain so that it helps shut that down. But it's also allowing you to burn fat for fuel. It's helping you kick out your own ketones um, so that your body is, is converting fat into fuel. Now the, the brain cells are open. The body's converting your fat. You're, you're having mental clarity and energy. You're having physical energy and you're not hungry. Your, your hunger actually gets shut down because it's going through this process that should normally happen. And the tea helps me with all of that. Plus it has anti-cancer properties, antioxidant properties, which I just did some videos last week on antioxidants and inflammation and insulin resistance and how important antioxidants are coming out to be in the whole insulin resistance thing and inflammation. So lots of information I know, but that tea gives me all of that. And I'm not hungry at all. And it doesn't break my fast. So then after my 16 hour fast, so I wake up in the morning, I have my tea, I sip on it. I can have it hot or cold. When I do eat my meal, I'm just going to have this 10 minutes before. Remember, makes me feel full quicker so I don't overeat. Um, helps protect my gut because it's got this gel matrix that just goes in and coats everything up. Slows down the delivery of food so now I'm not having those blood sugar spikes. It's a nicer sugar delivery and the insulin levels don't have to go as high. This has been proven to reduce blood sugar spikes by, I'm sorry, I, I've gotten it wrong in the past, by 13% with one packet, and no, it's more than that. Anyway, it's been proven to, to reduce a blood sugar spike. I got to go get because I second guessed myself. But this can reduce blood sugar spikes drastically and insulin spikes drastically in your system. If you're having high carbohydrate meals, you just have two of them. You just want to make sure that you're hydrating so all that fiber can move through. Um, and that's it. That's the system. It costs me about $5 a day. It has a 90-day money-back guarantee. It has a quality guarantee. And that's what saved my life. So I, how, how did I go from having a walker and a cane to being able to run up and down stairs? And I'm actually 
like not like full out running yet because I've had two hip replacements and a knee replacement. Um, but I'm starting to run again. I have sword fights with my grandson. I was out in the playground playing uh, tag with him and some older kids this weekend. Couldn't have done that two and a half years ago. The only thing I changed was that. Okay. So what, there were some questions we had that I was going to go over. Oh, let's talk about fats, fat and protein and um, fiber and carbohydrates. Okay. In nature, you're going to almost always find proteins and fats combined and fiber and carbohydrates combined. Why, 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 if nature's putting them together, do we feel like it's a good thing to separate them? Okay. Fats and protein. We're going to get to the fiber and carbohydrates. Protein is we know what builds muscle in our bodies, right? A certain amount of the protein goes to building blocks in the system. If we're getting in more protein than we can utilize, then we're going to, uh, it's going to get converted into a substance called urea and it's going to get excreted through your urine, which causes an excess load on your kidneys. If you're getting way too much protein, the last thing I want you to know about protein is when people are saying, oh, I, I get in 150 grams a meal, unless you're some kind of extreme athlete, that's probably way too much. Um, so it's going to go through your kidneys first, causing start to cause some kidney problems. Then it's going to store the rest as fat. So what it's not utilizing for building blocks goes to one of those two places. But when it is working properly and we're storing it as muscle, we're using it as building blocks, which is super healthy for, again, heart, liver, kidneys are all muscle made of protein, right? But what you might not know is those, those fats, the protein cells are, are wrapped up. If you look at meats, they have this like thin layer around the, the muscle cells. That thin layer is built up of, we're going to do this thing again. And I think you can guess where I'm going with this. Um, what do you think that it's built up of? That, that layer that holds the muscle together. Um, what do you think that's what that's built of? Do you guys know? Do you have any clue what it might be? Um, Cause it's actually pretty simple. And it also leads to why uh, some athletes who are overworking and having way too much creatine and, and all of that are having rhabdomyolysis. Um, so the thing that that muscle cell is wrapped in is fat. That cellular membrane that's holding that muscle tissue together, those cells, is made up of fat. So when you're having high protein, high creatine, low fat, that that should be supple and grow with your muscle becomes very rigid and um, like a, a paper shell. And when the muscle starts to grow and that that uh, tissue around it can't grow with it, it explodes. And now the muscle cells, the muscle tissues are going everywhere. And you see these people with these great big blown up arms, legs, whatever. Fats always need to be with proteins. It's a natural system and fats are not making you fat. I'll do some, I'm, I'm working on some videos about that. Uh, your saturated fats are not causing your heart disease. So we use olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, actually avocado oil, coconut oil, butter, ghee, and don't cut the fats off your meats and stop taking the yolks out of your eggs. Having the yolk, by the way, is also where the most protein is. If you're eating eggs for protein and you're taking the yolk out, it's like, it's a futile thing. Don't, it's, it's senseless. Stop doing it. They started taking the yolk out of eggs back when Ansel uh -huh. Keys started saying, oh, fats are bad for you. And they've now disproven that hundreds of times over. So stop doing that. Now, fiber and carbohydrates. Fiber, again, is paired with most carbohydrates, except for like honey because honey has bees, right? So that's going to slow us down if we're trying to gather honey. But fat, uh, fibers slow down carbohydrates from hitting the system and creating too much sugar in the bloodstream at one time. It allows this carbohydrate that you're eating as energy to be somewhat time released so that you're not getting the blood sugar spikes. You're getting this nice level delivery of energy without that fiber Without the fiber, I'm going to use a different finger. Without that fiber, the carbohydrate converts to sugar really quickly, goes into your bloodstream really quickly. 
pipes up your insulin really quickly and then starts to cause havoc throughout your body. So carbohydrates should always be paired with fiber. Always, 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 always be paired with fiber. Okay. All right. Any questions with any of that? Was there, was there something else? I know I've said I was going to talk about a number of things. Did I? For those of you guys who just joined, we're talking about insulin resistance. Um, I probably will end this pretty soon, but if you're having problems with, let's, yeah, yeah let's, let's talk about this. What is linked to insulin resistance and what are some of the symptoms that you might have if you think you're insulin resistant or that might tell you that you're insulin resistant. Okay. So number one, and this is the thing I'm going to be doing videos on all week is your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is 130 over 80 or higher, you are very likely insulin resistant. Don't need any other test than that. Okay. Since medication isn't going to fix this, don't need any other test than that. Start addressing your food, start doing what I just talked about and start getting your insulin under control. Yes, work with your doctor, but I'm gonna tell you, my doctors never caught it, never addressed it um, until I started doing the system. Now my doctor who I worked for is just like, I'm so proud of you, this is just amazing, I can't believe you did this, because she was terrified for my health that I wasn't gonna make it through my 60s too, because I was so sick. Okay, so, um, now I just lost myself. <laughs> That's how my day goes. Um, I started thinking about her, what happened, ADD brain. I was talking to you guys. I started thinking about this doctor who was a great friend, beautiful soul, wondering where she was and there went my brain. Um, symptoms, okay. So blood pressure is one, we're back, we're back. Um, another one that you're gonna look for is if you're starting to have that belly that's bulging, that's poking out, that's a sign of insulin resistance because your brain is now cueing your, your brain, hypothalamus is cueing your body to store fat in this area underneath your belly um, that is called brown fat, but it starts getting in around your, your organs like your liver, liver's on the side, your kidneys, your heart, your stomach, uh, all of that starts to get impacted by this fat and now your belly is poking out because it's extending the muscle underneath the belly. Whereas other fat for most people are just going to go around the body. That still is insulin resistance when you have of, or too much insulin. But if you're skinny everywhere else and the belly's poking out, that's a sign. If your triglycerides are high and your HDL is low, that's a sign that you're insulin resistant. Um, if you're having migraine headaches, body aches and pains, anxiety, uh, depression, those are all signs of insulin resistance. Um, this over overall, and I just did a video on that a few days ago, overall sense of pain that you just can't explain. Like, I, I don't know, doc, my whole body just hurts. I, I don't know, and they can't figure it out, and so they call it fibromyalgia. Most fibromyalgia is linked to insulin resistance, so there's a clue there as well. Any of these things can tell that you're insulin resistant. But if you also have, if you're a lady and you have PCOS, if you're a guy and you have erectile dysfunction, those two things, Dr. Bickman, who wrote Why We Get Sick, would call it metabolic infertility. Those are two big clues that you have insulin resistance. Um, and skin. If you have skin tags, those little mushroom-like projections that are poking out around your neck, under your arms, all of those places, that's insulin resistance. It's an excess production of skin cells because although most of the cells are, are resistant to insulin, there are some cells that are going to take up too much energy and so they're going to overproduce. Those um, skin cells called keratinocytes that create your skin tags are one of them. And then if you have dark skin patches on your neck, under your arms, on your elbows, uh, it could be on your knuckles, around your ankles, Anywhere where skin rubs, um, ladies, it could be around your bra line. That's a sign of insulin resistance because it's overproducing melanocytes and they show up as uh, melanin difference or um, melasma can be linked to insulin resistance. So any of those, if you've got one, you're most likely, if you've got two, start addressing it. If you've got four or more, you need to take care of it. So, all right, I saw... <laughs> 
Anybody have at least one of those? Type a one in the in the chat for me. Anybody have at least one of those? So high blood pressure, belly that's poking out, skin issues, um, PCOS, hormonal issues, headaches, body aches. Um, okay. So any of you guys have at least two of those? Put a two in here for me. You had all of them. So the, the bottom line is, you guys, right, I get, I'm getting a, a several all of them on, on all the platforms. So with, the, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to understand that you are likely insulin resistant and you should probably take care of it. And again, it comes down to our food. This is not a medication. Um, you know, people will say they feel better after they've taken metformin or, or some of the other medications, but it's not curing the problem. Three, <laughs> Raquel, you're ahead of me. <laughs> she, she said three, so she had at least three of them. But you guys, this is, pro is prominent with most all of us. We have at least two to three of those, right? Yeah, so, and I would encourage that for most people. But so what do you do when you have like a wedding to go to or a birthday? And I'm not talking about every day. Do you, um, do you just avoid that at all costs now? And because this, the protocol that I talked about allows you to have those moments in time and just use the fiber beforehand and still have that cake at the wedding. So that's how I choose to do it. But yes, I would say cut out sugar and processed foods as much as you can. But I also want this to be um, easy and sustainable for people. So I find that there are some people who can just do that, but how long are they willing to do that? How long are they willing to just like cut out all of that for the rest of their life? And I'm not, this is nothing against you because I totally applaud that, but most people just can't. So the system allows it to be sustainable and easy and flexible for us. So it's giving us back the fibers and the energy that we need so that our bodies can live in the life that we live today. Um, I cook most of my meals at home, but I have meals out from time to time. I don't worry about it because I just get this in and now all of my symptoms have been reversed and I stay healthy every day. Am I cognizant of it and cut out sugar and processed foods as much as possible? Yes. Do I do it all the time? No, but you know, so that's where we're at. Most people, I want you to start where you're at and start to feel better with what you're doing. And then if you want to work into something more, more uh, restrictive, that's up to you. But in the meantime, I want you to know that your health doesn't have to be like highly restrictive and difficult. That's the thing is it shouldn't have to be difficult to get your life back and to have your energy back and to have your health back and to overcome all of these things. Troy just jumped in. Troy, I, if you're still here, you want to type in and let them know. I would invite you on, but I'm on multiple platforms again. Um, Troy has done really good things with his health by doing this. And you guys, I, I have so many people that I work with that would have never stuck with it if it wasn't easy. Because we all have those moments of time when we're like, I can do this. I'm really committed to my health. I'm going to do everything I need to do. And I'm going to be really restrictive. And then Times come along, Christmas is coming up, Thanksgiving is coming up, and then you're like, dude, I just don't know. I just don't know how much I can not have all the times with my family. And the cool thing with the protocol is that it allows you to have those times with the family. And like we're having, so I don't know what everybody else is planning for Thanksgiving, but we don't have the Thanksgiving I used to have as a kid. So we're going to have turkey. I love cranberries. I'm Native American. Um, our tribe raised cranberries, so cranberries are a must for me. Um, I make my own so I can limit the sugar that goes into them. We're going to have corn casserole. We're going to have green bean casserole. My son wants Hawaiian rolls. Um, what else did we, what my daughter-in-law and I talk about? Um, oh, they just, we just went up and picked apples up in Pennsylvania, and she still has apples, so she's going to do like an apple crisp instead of a pumpkin pie. Lots of carbohydrates in that, right? Do I have to be like, nope? We're not having any of that. Yes, Jules, I get that. So, um, and unfortunately though, corn as our ancestors, more specifically yours, grew them, it was very different than what we have today. <laughs> Once a day only. Yeah, you, 
so Lisa, <laughs> you made me say it, Lisa. Okay, so understand though, and I don't know if you were here earlier, if it's, so we have three macros in our food, right? Protein, protein, fiber, and carbohydrates. If it's not a protein, and it, I'm sorry, protein, fats, and carbohydrates, like fiber is stuck in my head. Um, so if it's not a protein and it's not a fat, then it is a carbohydrate. So if you're telling me you eat carbohydrates only once a day, then you're telling me that you never have spinach, green beans, broccoli, um, asparagus, any of that, any other time of day. And so corn is very different. And what, um, what has happened um, to it is that it's, again, like everything else, it had fibers, enzymes, and nutrients stripped out of it, and it's been modified to the point that it's really high in these starchy carbohydrates. So I love corn too, but I know that the corn that was uh, indigenous to, to this continent is nowhere near what we have today. And so it's not giving us the health that we used to get from it. Um, and so that's part of the protocol that I use Jules is putting all that back in. And it's not just the corn, like um, cranberries are even bigger than they used to be. Um, you know, peaches are apples and, and all of it is just different. You guys, if you please go Google what our foods used to look like so that like I'm a very visual person. If you can do that and start to see how much our food has changed and even think like I have, I have um, clients who are pescatarian who are vegetarian who are like i i buy everything at the farmer's market i do all the stuff like i i'm but i'm still sick but this can't help but i'm going to try it because it has a 90 day bunny back guarantee and they call me back and they're like okay some of the bloating in my gut's gone down i have more energy i would have never thought but it makes sense to them because our foods have been stripped so whether you're eating all that clean food or not the system is only going to add to your health Again, it's not going to make you lose more weight than you need to lose. It's not going to do that. And I don't like to talk about the weight loss as much because it really is a side effect of being healthy. Um, so there's that. Do you guys just understand that our food is different and that we do we do have to, to put back what's been stripped out. And you know what's even scarier to me is that even with all the changes they've made in our food now, they're talking about all these 3D printers. They're talking about printing our food. So if our food is already unrecognizable to our body and it's causing us to feel sick, what do you think is going to happen when that happens? So I'm all about putting back in what is, is meant to be there. And, um, before I go, before I go off, um, cause it's been almost two hours now. Is that crazy? Is that crazy? Um, medications, on this side of the tracks, I am not an advocate for medications unless they are life-saving, as in, oh, they had an accident, they have an infection, we need to take care of that. Um, I don't I don't like to be on medications. That's my personal choice. Two and a half years ago, when I started the protocol that's based on these real foods, um, I threw away all my medications, and I've never filled a refill since. Um and it's just, it's nice. I don't have 10 medications sitting on my counter that I'm having to worry about filling every day or taking at different times or dad, or that it's hurting my liver or my kidneys or, you know, that it's causing any of these other problems. I just know that I'm feeding my body what it needs and I'm healthier and healthier every year. Instead of getting older every year, I feel like I'm getting younger every year. I want to show you guys a picture real quick. If I can pull it up here while we're in. So this is what the system has done for me, you guys. Um, I have a number of pictures. I used to not. That's me two and a half years ago. Um, so at 56 and a half years old, the difference between that and now is is, is somewhat drastic to me. I, I feel like a whole different person. And it wasn't just about the weight loss. My skin feels better. My hair is growing in thicker. My eyesight's better. My teeth and gums aren't bleeding all the time. I don't have the arthritis. I don't have the pain. I don't have the brain fog. I don't have all of that. Do I feel like it's been reverse aging me? I do. 
And why? Because I'm just getting nutrients to my body that it's always needed instead of putting medications in that are causing more problems. So if we know that, um, if we know that this is a dietary disorder and that it's not going to get fixed by medications. Why would we do that? Address the food, address what's... I don't know why your screen is black. Mitzi, but you can see the comments. It shouldn't be black. Is anybody else's on TikTok's black? It may have been for a second, but it shouldn't be. Okay. Um... Maybe it's because I've been on for two hours and TikTok says, we've had enough of you talking, honey. Go do something else. So you guys, the other thing is when you do the protocol with me, you're getting me as a coach. You get to you get to have conversations with me. You get to text me and say, hey, I have questions about this. We work through what it looks like for you. It's not any just like um, one size fits all. If you want to do keto and do this, do keto and do this. If you want to be a vegan and do this, do that. Do what works for you. This just supports you in your healthier choices and getting your health back. Um, so, and Mitzi, I would love to talk to you anyway. Let's, I'm going to screenshot this. Let's have a conversation because um, it seems like we're probably on similar pathways and I'd love to, I'd love to continue that conversation. All right, guys, I'm about done. Not only am I ADD, I'm autistic, so... My social battery is, I need to go take an hour to take some time and then I can call clients. But um, I love you all. I will be back tomorrow morning and uh, we'll talk some more. Look for the videos that are going to come out over the next few days about hypertension, your high blood pressure, which leads into cardiovascular disease and why insulin resistance is causing that. And We'll get a little bit more into the science with that. And otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for spending your morning with me. Mitzi, thank you for all your interaction. Raquel, Carla, Prina, everybody over here. I don't know, Dan, if you're still on. Melba, thanks, you guys. And we will talk to you all later. Have a good day.